Good morning. Glad to see everyone out this morning. Let's turn to page 430 as we begin. Page 430, the windows of heaven are open. The windows of heaven are open, the blessings are falling tonight. There's joy, joy, joy in my heart, since Jesus made everything right. I gave him my old tattered garment, he gave me a robe of pure light. I'm feasting on manna from heaven, and that's why I'm happy tonight. I thought about saying, let's happy today, but that doesn't rhyme with robes of pure white, so I guess we have to have to keep the night in there. Let's turn to page uh, 658. 658. Hopefully you're walking in sunlight while the world walks in darkness. Let's all stand as we sing on the first, page 658. Walking in sunlight all of my journey Over the mountains, through the deep vale Jesus has said, I'll never forsake thee Promise divine that never can fail Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight Flooding my soul with glory divine Hallelujah, I am rejoicing Singing His praise as Jesus is mine Shadows around me, shadows above me Never conceal my Savior and guide. He is the light, in Him is no darkness. Ever I'm walking close to His side. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah, I am rejoicing, singing His praise. As Jesus is mine In the bright sunlight Ever rejoicing Resting my way To mansions above Singing his praises Gladly I'm walking Walking in sunlight Sunlight of love Heavenly sunlight Heavenly sunlight Lighting my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah, I am rejoicing, singing His praise as Jesus is mine. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the sunlight that you've given us. Thank you for the Word, uh, the Bible that you've given to us that, that gives light uh, to us uh, when we walk in a an age of darkness, Lord, are we in the church, and as we uh, trust in you, you give us light to, to walk down the paths of our lives, uh, give us encouragement, uh, gives us uh, joy in our salvation. Lord, I do pray that you'd be at our services today, pray that your presence would be here uh, speaking to our hearts. Lord, allow us to, to open our hearts to, to your will and what you would have us to learn and, and do today. Lord, just pray that you'd continue to bless our singing and be at the preaching to follow. Just then we pray, amen. You may be seated. Let's turn back a few pages to 651. Page 651. I have a song I love to sing since I've been redeemed. Page 651. I have a song I love to sing. I will glory in my 
Savior's name. I have a Christ that satisfies since I have been redeemed. To do His will, my highest price, since I have been redeemed. Since I have been redeemed, since I have been redeemed, I will glory in His name. Since I have been redeemed, I will glory in my Savior's name. I have a witness bright and clear since I have been redeemed, dispelling every doubt and fear since I have been redeemed, since I have been redeemed, since I have been redeemed, I will glory in his name since I have been redeemed. I will glory in my Savior's name. I have a home prepared for me since I have been redeemed. Where I shall dwell eternally since I have been redeemed. Since I have been redeemed. Since I have been redeemed. I will glory in his name since I have been redeemed. I will glory in my Savior's name. We'll sing one more, uh, page 420. Page 420, my wonderful Lord, my wonderful Lord. My wonderful Lord, my wonderful Lord, by angels and seraphs in heaven adored, I know Thou art mine, my Savior divine, my wonderful, wonderful Lord. Let's sing that chorus one more time. My wonderful Lord, my wonderful Lord, my angels and seraphs in heaven adored, I know Thou art mine, my Savior divine, my wonderful, wonderful Lord. This time, uh, Brother Jay, Miss Susie, will come and sing for us. Mercy and love evermore. 
And my heart bowed in shame as I called on his name. And Calvary covers it all. Calvary covers it all. My past with its sin and stain. My guilt and despair. Jesus took on him there. And Calvary covers it all. How matchless the grace when I looked on his face of this Jesus my crucified Lord. My redemption complete I then found at his feet and Calvary covers it all. Calvary covers it all. My past with its sin and sin, my guilt and despair, Jesus took on him there and Calvary covers it all. My guilt and despair, Jesus took on him there and Calvary covers it I should have thought to stay up here, and, but I don't have to introduce you no more. They, everybody knows who you are now. So. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you again for the opportunity to be here. If you will, take your Bibles, open up to Romans chapter number 8. It's a familiar portion of Scripture, and i got to make sure I do this right. Are we good now? Okay, good. All right. In uh, Romans, in uh, chapter number 8, if you will, I want to take a verse of scripture and then I'm going to go through the, uh, some areas of the Bible. Um, by way of testimony this morning, I guess is the way to say this, you, uh, everyone has uh, moments in their life, if you will, that uh, we have those make or break moments. Okay, and uh, what I mean by that is this, is you get to a point you have to make a decision I'm thinking of a friend of mine right now that just, uh, he had called me about a, uh, four or five months ago as a storm came through. He was driving in Greenville, and as he was driving in Greenville, he had his kids in the back seat of the truck, and he said to me, he goes, he says, I got to tell you this one. He says, uh, and I said, yeah, what's that? He says, all of a sudden, this big oak tree was falling. He says, I had to either gun it or hit the brakes and throw it in reverse real quick to miss this tree altogether. He said, you know me, he said, I just gunned it. And uh, it was a make or break moment. The tree still crashed on his truck. And when it did, he said, I turned around into the back seat of the truck to see how my kids were. Not a scratch on them. The truck is totaled, he says. That tree came down and crushed his truck, but it got the bed and crushed it. And he says, now is that the Lord or what? And I says, here's a guy who didn't want anything to do with the Lord at one point in his life, but he came to a make or break moment since he had been saved. I'd always wondered, has he really got it? Is he really saved? Does he really understand what he's got? And then when he calls me to tell me about what happened, he says, the truck can be replaced, but my kids couldn't. And so we start to get our things in perspective, if you will. We start to look in reality of what really is important. And by way of testimony, I want you to see in verse number 28, it says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them that are called according to his purpose. You don't know always what you're going to face on a day-to-day -day basis. You get up every morning, you go to your job, you think everything's just going to be a great day, it's going to be standard everyday operating procedures, you're going through your day, you leave. I went on a little trip with my wife here 
and we were over to see some friends and on the way over my alternator decides to go out and I'm thinking boy we're halfway we're a couple hours from home and I'm thinking this is not a good thing and so we call up the guy and he says what do you do you know it's the power you can see it just draining in the battery but we made it to our destination and then we even tried to drive home and get it back to a mechanic that we know so we made it back to the mechanic by the grace of God and those moments that you have in life you have to get your decisions already I would say it this way to have them made in your mind already and some of the decisions that you're going to face in life you can be a victim or you can be a victor you have to decide which way am I going to go I can say woe is me or I can say how wonderful is my God and understanding that I think helps a lot of us get over the hurdles that we have to face in life now that doesn't mean you won't face trials and tribulations for in this world you shall suffer tribulation. But be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. So when you have the Lord Jesus Christ on your side as your Savior, and you're a child of God, and as you go through your life, you know by the Word of God now, and I'm trying to give you a testimony via the Bible, and I'll say it this way, when the Bible comes to life, you know, you go through trials and you can read this book. I once uh, said to my pastor, I says, it's amazing the verses of Scripture that pop off your mind when you're witnessing to somebody. It's amazing that all of a sudden the verses, if you're trying to help somebody, they come to remembrance. I mean, a lot of times, I'll be honest with you, I can't remember where it is in the Bible, but I remember the verse. And when you remember the verse, you can sit there and you can help somebody and get over and get through a, a words fitly spoken, if you will okay, are like apples of gold and pictures of silver. And so all of a sudden you get that verse of scripture. But my preacher made this comment to me one time and he said, you'll never remember what you've never read. So that's why it's so important to read the Bible. And if you read it and continually continue in the Bible, the Word of God, it's the living Word of God. We call it the living Word of God. Jesus Christ is the Word. And it's the bread from heaven. And so as we feed upon that bread and we sit there and we take in that bread, we start to realize, okay, there's some things that you're going to face in your day that you can get through. How many here ever get upset right away when something goes wrong? Anybody like me on that? Okay. We have to admit, we get upset. But why? I'm going to show you in a second through the Bible that there are some things that are going to come your way that you're not expecting. There are going to be some things you're certainly not going to like. But those things can all be overcome through the Word of God. And in the process of that, what happens? You start to see God for real in your life. And I'm going to take you to a time back about uh, 17, 18 years ago now. Uh, back in May of 2003, I believe it was, my son was diagnosed with cancer. He was two years old. I never thought kids get cancer. Never thought that at all. It was surprising all of a sudden when we found ourselves in the children's health care hospital here in Atlanta, how many kids actually get cancer. I didn't even realize they could be born with cancer. All this stuff, all of a sudden you start to realize. Well, my wife and I, when we uh, started on that journey, I say it this way, is to be, we found the news it was our anniversary. And just before that, we were out knocking on doors and somebody in our church, our son was bruising. And I say bruising, if you touched him like that, he had a bruise. And you couldn't figure out what was going on. He looked like a speckled pup. But he was two years old, and every time we figured it out later, every time we picked him up, there was ten more bruises. Every time you picked him up. So my wife, for fear of going to the doctor now, thinking they were, we were beating our child, okay, because of all the bruises, I said, you can't worry about that. You need to go to the doctor and get checked out. And one of the ladies in our church at that time had said to us, they said, uh, you know, that could be leukemia. And I said to my wife, hush up. You know, I says, I don't want to think the worst of this thing. Maybe it's something simple. All right. And when that happened, what happened? We went, she got... And then I looked at his skin, and his skin, when you looked at it, had these little red fissures running through his skin. And as they were looking, I said, boy, that can't be right. 
And I said to my wife, I said, why don't you take him to the doctor, get him checked out. It won't hurt to get him checked out, and let's see what's going on. Doctor didn't think anything was wrong. And even when we got done with the doctor, but she said, he said to go get the blood work done. So we went and got the blood work done. And she calls me back. I'm out buying a present for our anniversary. And uh, she calls me back up. He has leukemia. We need to get to Eggleston's Children's Hospital right away. And I'm like, and she goes, what do you want me to do? She's distraught. I'm trying to process what's, what we're going on. And I said, well, go to the house. I'll meet you at the house. And when we get to the house, I says, then we'll, we'll, we'll meet together. We'll drive up to the, the hospital. Right then I stopped. And this is one of my points, by the way. First thing we did was pray. I called up my pastor. I said, our son's been diagnosed with leukemia. I said, would you just pray for us? And he said, sure. He prayed for us. He got done, hung up the phone. I said, no, Lord, that was great. He prayed for us. I said, but I'm coming to you, and I need prayer. I need you to answer some prayers. I need wisdom. Why? Because I've not been this way before. I need to help, have you help me be strong for my wife and my family. I've got four kids and my wife. And I'm sitting there, and I said, now my work, everything else wasn't even in the picture, to be honest with you. It was what we were going to do with our son. And so as I sat there, we prayed, or I prayed to the Lord. I get to the house. Kathy's already standing outside with the baby, holding the baby, two years old. And, uh, and I said, go on in and get the camera. What? I said, go on in and get the camera. In the back of my mind, I'm thinking, if this doesn't go well, I'll have these pictures. Now, she says I have pictures, but I don't know. I'm not a photogenic guy. But what I told her was, I don't think I had a picture of my son before that day with me and him. Two years old. I know I have a child. Now let me stop right there and pause just for a moment. You get doing everything you seem to be. Every man doeth that which seemeth right in his own eyes, and in the end thereof are the ways of death. Well, in this way, I want you to look at it from this standpoint. I'm serving the Lord. I'm witnessing. I'm teaching. I'm doing all I can for the Lord. I'm working my regular job. I'm doing that as well as other things. And a friend of mine, I called up to have him pray for us, and he said, well, that's not supposed to happen to you. And I thought to myself, why not? He said, well, because you're living for God. You're doing everything you're supposed to do and all that. And I said, well, what exempts me from that? Now, typically in the Bible, who do you go to? In the Bible, when you start to see somebody who's got problems, give me a book in the Bible. Job. First one I thought of. Why? Because there isn't anybody that's ever lived since Job, as far as I'm concerned, that's had it as bad as Job had it. And all his news came in one day. He had four messengers come back to back to back. One wasn't done telling him one thing, and another wasn't done, and another wasn't done, and another wasn't done, until he you know, got down to the last messenger. All that stuff fell upon him in one day. And I thought to myself, I still don't have it as bad as him. But you can glean something from the Word of God. And when you glean something from the Word of God, I want you to see, if you will, turn in Job now, chapter number 23. Job chapter number 23. Here's Job. I'm going to skip towards that. And I'm going to go back to what originally happened and give you the background there. So as you look at Job now in chapter number 23, as soon as I get to it here, okay, in chapter number 23, here's how Job felt, okay, he's already lost everything he owns, his children, his livestock, his way of life, everything's gone. He gets down to this point in his life, and it's important for us to see it. In verse number 3, it says, Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his seat. The Bible says in Hebrews that we may come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and grace to help in a time of need. In other words, he wanted to get right there to the seat where God was. 
See, what you got to remember is this. Tears are a language God understands. Don't ever be afraid to cry and cry out to God. You hear that word crying out to God all the time. Why? Because it's right here. But I want you to see some things that Job is going through. Now, he's already lost everything, and at this time, he's got his friends encouraging him. Okay? And you'll have people that'll come to you that don't have a clue why you're going through what you're going through. Okay? But I want you to see it. Watch this now. Chapter number uh, 23, go to verse 6. Will he plead against me with his great power? No, but he would, uh, he would put strength in me. Then the righteous might dispute with him so that it should be delivered from Ever from my judge, ever from my judge, behold, I go forward, but he is not there. And backward, but I cannot perceive him. On the left hand, where he doth work, but I cannot behold him. He hideth himself on the right hand, that I cannot see him. You hear, Job? Here he is at his point in his life. He's lost everything, and he's sitting there. Where God, where are you? This is that make or break moment right here. You've got to determine in your life and purpose in your heart that you're going to stand with God no matter what happens. The true test of your Christianity, if you will, is not how things when they're going great for you. It's when all of a sudden things turn and go against you. And so when you start to think there, I start to think of Job and I start to think, why? Why am I going through this? What did I do? All the things start running through your head and through your mind. Why have I got to go through this? It's constant. By the way, ever since I've answered a call to preach, it's been constant. It's like, Lord, really? Another one? And you sit there, you get frustrated with it because all it does is continue. But watch what happens now. Here's where Job comes into it and he says, But he knoweth the way that I take. I have to keep reminding myself, don't quit. Stay with it. Don't give up. Why? Because it's my God whom I serve. And it's my God who comes on my behalf. And you have to remind yourself, is there anything too hard for the Lord? But watch now. We go down to verse number 13. But he is in one mind, and who can turn him? The Lord. He said what? I am the Lord, I change not. The Lord the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's of one mind. He has one plan, one purpose. And that his son would come to the earth and die for sinners. And then he would be redeeming us back to heaven with him. Okay, now watch this though. He says, who can turn him? And what is his soul desire, even that he doeth? For he performeth the thing that is appointed for who? What does that say there? For me. Did you know each and every one of us in here today has something in our lives that is appointed for us? The Bible says it's appointed unto a man once to die. After this, the judgment. I'm careful when I say that. I made a statement one time at a funeral service, and I said, somebody be here today, might not have six hours, six weeks, six months. Turned out to be a cousin of mine six months later, was in a car accident, and she was dead. Saved or not, I don't know. But I preached the gospel at that funeral. And my point is, is this. He said, I have appointed it for who? For me. And many such things are with him. Therefore, I am troubled at his presence when I consider I am afraid of him. For God, what? Maketh my heart soft. And the Almighty troubleth me. He's appointed those things, but the Almighty troubleth me. He maketh my heart soft. Have you ever met somebody where everything appears to be going their direction all the time? And what you'll find out about that person typically is this. They're hardened. They don't care about your situation. They can't even feel for your situation. Why? Because they're not going through it. But wait a minute now. When God starts to work on his people and he gives you that which is appointed for you, what happens? All of a sudden, we can start to relate. Can't tell you how many people we've seen that had kids with cancer, different things happening, and all of a sudden, you can feel with them. 
I'm like-minded, if you will. My wife, we were having dinner all the way out in Madison, Georgia. Was it in Madison? It was Madison, Georgia. We went into this restaurant out there, stopped in to get lunch. The girl waiting on us, at, or seating us at the thing, she goes, I know you. All the way back when she was a little girl herself, like my son, we met that family. That girl's grown up now, and she's there waiting on tables and inter introducing people. I said, how do you remember? I said, I wouldn't have known her from Adam, but Kathy sat there, and she goes, I know you. Is your name this? And she goes, yeah. And I thought, how do you remember? But we were with these same families. And by the way, let me stop here and say this. If the doctors could heal you, and I have nothing against doctors, but if the doctors could heal you, everyone that goes into a hospital would be healed and come out. Ultimately, it's God who determines who lives and who dies. Not even Satan has control over that. Death is the final enemy. But when you start to face these things and you start to see these things come into your life, we run into people even to this day. And what you look at and you see, for the Almighty, for God hath maketh my heart soft, and the Almighty troubleth me because I was not cut off before the darkness, neither hath he covered the darkness from my face. The darkest day you'll face on earth, even if the sun was shining and the clouds moved in, you can still know for certain that God is still on the throne. The sun is still above the clouds. If you ever got on a plane and gone and flown, and when you're going somewhere, first time I ever flew, I got up there and I'm going, man, this is cool. You're up in the air and the clouds are down below and the clouds look nice and white and fluffy like little cotton balls. And I thought to myself, man, you could jump right out there and run around. Be a bad mistake. But at the same token, that's the opinion you get. Picture it as this way. Here's God's view of what's going on. It may be dark from our side, but God has the sunshine and it's all light. And what we're trying to see is how Job, he's feeling. He's lost everything. Now let's go back to the beginning of where Job was and look at that in chapter number 1. <clears throat> in verse 1 it says, There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. Eschewed evil. He hated it. He didn't want to be around it. It wasn't even going to be in his presence. By the way, that's why we're here on earth and God's in heaven. Because he's separated from our sin. He can't be around it. He doesn't want to be around it. It's not in him to be around it. He loves the sinner, but he hates the sin. And so when you sit there and you start to think, okay, here's what's going on. And you see this, and he feared God, and he eschewed evil. He was perfect. And by the way, this is God's testimony of Job. This is not Job patting himself on the back and saying, hey, I'm the guy. No, this is God saying of Job. Now, stop and think just for a second. What's God say about us? What's God say about us? That's right. That's right. He loves us. But what does he say about us? What does he know about us that we think he doesn't know? If God was to give his testimony, our testimony, and label it for us, how would it go for us? That's something we need to consider. Why? Because here he's talking about Job, but wait a minute now. <clears throat> so that, in verse 3, he said, So that this man was the greatest of all the men of the East. It would be fair to say that Job had it going on. Because God had blessed him so much. Okay? Now you have those that teach that if you do everything God says, God's going to bless you beyond all belief, and you're going to have more money running out of your... It's not true. You have money because you're faithful to do with what you're supposed to do with the money. Okay? And if God knows he can trust you with it to do what's right with it and not consume it upon your own lust, then what would happen? He might give you some extra. But I've always found God to do this. I'm reminded of a story of a little boy that goes into the drugstore, and in those days they had the drugstore set up and the candy rack was right there, and the 
druggist looked over at the little boy and he says, go ahead, reach in, get you a handful. And he stood there, kept looking at it, kept looking at it, kept looking at it. And the guy said, go ahead, you help yourself, get you some. And as he kept there, he kept looking at it, kept looking at it, kept looking at it. And finally, the druggist walked over, opened it up, reached in, grabbed a handful and gave it to the boy. And his father asked him, he said, son, why didn't you grab it when he said it? He said, because he had bigger hands. Okay. Our God has bigger hands. And so when our God reaches into his pocket and he gives us little handfuls on purpose, what happens? We can't contain what he gives us. Think of that for a second. Our stories are not yet written, but our Lord knows the end from the beginning. He already knew Job's end. He already knew what Job was going to go through. But Job said what? He knows the way that I take. Hey, wait a minute now. Here's your make or break moment. Which way are you going to take? Do you realize that a lot of people get mad right there? Job's wife got mad. She said, why don't you curse God and die? And Job had to turn around and say to her, you speak as one of the foolish women. How can we receive that which is good at the hand of the Lord and not also receive evil? The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And then on top of that, he said, what? In all this, Job sinned not, nor did he charge God foolishly. We like to think that we know better than God when it comes to the troubles and the trials and everything we're going to face. But God brings those trials and those troubles in our lives to show us we can't handle it. He does it so that we get to know Him better. If you've ever been taken from a trouble and lifted out of that miry clay, if you will, and you've been set upon a rock and so forth in your life, you know what it is to be saved. There's nothing like it. I used to get mad at certain people in my life. I say, man, I said, you never told me. I'm on a fast track to hell and you never said a word about it. By the way, dangerous place for us to be is to say it's us four and no more. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, myself, I don't care where the rest of you go. That's a dangerous place to be for a Christian. Think about that. And so we go forward now and you look. It, it may be that my sons have sinned in verse 5, he says, and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. Job offered up offerings on behalf of his children, hoping that they would be doing right. And if they're doing wrong, he's hoping to make it right. Can I help you with something? I think deep down maybe Job knew something was going on with his kids and they weren't doing right. Nothing wrong with praying for your kids. You ought to pray for your kids. You ought to keep praying for your children. Okay? But at the end of the day, you're responsible for your actions. At the end of the day. God is going to hold you accountable. He's not going to hold me accountable. My kids are growing up. I trust that all of them are living for God and doing what they're supposed to do. But I'm not there all the time. God is. I praise God for my kids. I praise God for my grandkids. And I look at the, how do I want to say it? The blessings continue to come in my family. But I look at my children, I look at my grandchildren, and at the end of the day, I'm not responsible for them. I'm responsible for me. And when I get before the throne, God's going to judge me for how I handled my life. Okay, I give to my kids. I try to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. I try to train them up, a child, in the way they should go so that when they're older, they will not depart from it. Hey, by the way, it doesn't say they won't depart from it. He said when they're older, they'll not depart from it. Sometimes somebody's got to go out there. The prodigal son had to go out there to find out that it was better back home. Sometimes a child of God's got to drift a little bit before he realizes what he really had. But I got to help you here. We don't need to stand there ready to clobber them over the head when they come back. They need to be graded with open arms. We missed you. We love you. We're glad you're back. So many people never recover. They have that make or break moment. 
And by the way, some of them have gone out into sin, done whatever it is they're doing, and then they turn around and decide they want to come back, but they find no place to come back to. Because now they're looked down upon. The Bible says, you being spiritual, remember such a one, and consider such a one in a spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Could happen to any one of us. Don't think we're exempt from an attack from Satan. Job wasn't. God took and he brought Job into the picture. Satan's going around doing his business, being the accuser of the brethren, and as he's doing the accusing, God says, what you doing? He says, I'm going out and about to and fro throughout the whole earth, searching out on behalf of men. Satan's the accuser of the brethren, and then God leans over and says, hey, bud, you considered my servant Job? He says, does Job serve thee for naught? You put a hedge of protection about him. You've kept him safe. You've done everything. I can't get to him because you won't let me get to him. And by the way, Satan wants to get to every one of us. But see, he can't get to us unless God says, okay. And then God went ahead and okayed it. He says, all right. He says, Take, touch all that he hath. Only touch not the man. By the way, Job's trials weren't done when he lost everything. Next thing, he was attacked personally and afflicted with boils from the bottom of his feet to the, head of, to the top of his head. I've had boils as a kid. I know what that is. I can relate there. Still got the scars from them. But when you're a kid, you don't know any different. You just sit there and you think that's just another thing. But then when all of a sudden you read about it in the Bible, what happens? It changes. But you have a make or break moment. Now watch this. And the Lord said to Satan, verse 7, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth. And the Lord said to Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? There is none like him, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and issueth evil. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast thou made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? that the bless the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. Now here's where the accuser of the brethren steps in. He says, but put forth thy hand now and touch all that he hath and he will curse thee to thy face. I want to say it this way. Job was at a make or break moment when this happened in his life. Satan, the accuser of the brethren, came forward and said, look, it, if you'll do this to Job, this is what he'll do to you. Just because you blessed him. And by the way, that's us today. When things are going good, Job had it all. That he was the greatest in the East. But he had it all. But what happened? God said, take all that he hath. Touch not the man. And that wasn't enough for Satan. As you read the rest of the story, we're not going to go there for the sake of time. But that wasn't enough. He wanted to destroy Job. Literally, it wasn't enough to get all that he had. That didn't work. He proved himself. I go back to that verse of Scripture where it says, He knows the way that I take. You're at a make or break moment in your life. And you have to determine what it is you're going to do in your life. Are you going to be a victim? Or are you going to get the victory? You're in a make or break moment. Job was in a make or break moment for certain. But here's what's funny about this whole thing. And I say funny, but funny in the way like this. God already knew the way he was going to take. If you don't live your life for God and being mindful of God, when those challenges come, you'll fall. Put it down, you'll fall. Why? because you never prepared for that day. My wife and I, when that happened with our son, as I said, we took pictures out there, in the, out there in the yard. We got done, we loaded up into the van, and we were driving up to the hospital, and all the way up there, she says, Who's, what should we do? I said, let's call. You start calling who you know to call to pray, I'll start calling who I know to call to pray. By the time we got there, we run out of people to call to pray. 
We were pulling in the parking lot. We go in, and when they go in, what happens? They confirmed, in fact, that it was leukemia. They were going to start their treatments that day, that hour, right then and there. And uh, it was uh, 28 days that one of us was going to have to stay in the hospital because he was two years old. They won't leave an infant in there without their parent. And so I said, well, that's a no-brainer. Kathy's got to stay. I said, I'll go home. I'll take care of the kids. If you need anything, I'll bring it back up, whatever the case may be. We get done that first day. They start dousing them with the chemo. And for 28 days, my wife was a trooper. <laughs> 28 days, less two. I think I stayed there twice. Came Mother's Day in our church. Preacher calls me up and he says to me, he goes, uh, how's things going? It's going about as well as they can go. And uh, he says, well, that's why I'm calling. He says, it's Mother's Day. Sunday. This was a Saturday. And uh, he says, is there any way you can, the church voted on Kathy being Mother of the Year? <laughs> any way you can get her there? I said, I don't know, preacher. Getting out of there is going to take an act of God out of that room. I says, and I know you don't want me to lie to her. Oh, no, don't do that. I said, well, I'll get something. The Lord will give me something. On the way up the elevator, it dawns on me. It's Mother's Day. I'm a dad. You got to go to church. And so I told her, I said, look, you haven't had a good night's sleep all week. I said, why don't you go home, get a good night's sleep, soak in the tub, whatever you want to do. Next morning, go to church. And when you get done with church, come back up and then I'll swap out again with you. I'll stay here with him tonight. She does. She comes back to, from church. She's a little miffed. And she goes, you knew. And I go, knew what? She goes, you knew. I go, knew what? And, uh, and she goes, you knew that they did that. And I said, what are you angry about? And she goes, I just don't want people feeling sorry for us. And that's when I said to her, I said, let's give God some credit. The church voted on Sunday before Mother's Day, who was going to be Mother of the Year. We found out he had leukemia on Monday. And in fact, she was the Mother of the Year, in my opinion but my opinion's biased. And so in any case, she got that, and we continued on. But to go back to that first night, we got in our room. They put us in this room. They'd given him the chemo and everything, and we're sitting there. It's about 9.15 that night. Remember Job saying, where are you? I can't find you. I look to the left hand. I look to the right. I can't find you. I don't know where you're at, Lord. We're sitting in there just watching our little baby sitting there and laying on a bed, taking chemo in. And about 9.15 that night, I said to her, I said, if you can't tell somebody else is in this room with us, there's something wrong. And she said, well, I can tell something's here. I said, and we know it to be the Lord. Now, I say that to say this. In Daniel, you remember the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Okay, they were in that fiery trial, if you will. We were in that fiery trial. There was my wife, my son, and myself. There was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And I say this to say this. This is more than stories. This is a living word of God. If you have this, there isn't anything you won't deal with in your life that God doesn't what? Help you with it. Prepare you for it. You know how to respond. Why? Because everybody, what? Somebody made the comment, Job. Know right where to go when you're having a real bad day. You never have a bad day. It's always a good reminder. I'll never have a day like Job, I hope. But it is a good reminder to see how Job what? Responded. He had that make or break moment. And while we're in that hospital that night, I go home to get my wife some clothes and stuff like that. And as I go back home, I find myself on our little hassock footstool, if you will, down there, bawling like a baby. And I said, Lord, if you're going to take my son, help me to be better, not bitter. Yes, sir. It's a make or break moment. You think of Abraham, his only begotten son. He has to take him up there and offer him up on the altar. 
And he's sitting there thinking all the time, I got to kill my son. I got to kill my son. I'm thinking all the time, the Lord's going to take my son or is he going to heal my son? Either way, I had to accept what God had for us. So you, you've got the prayer. You've got the presence of the Lord when he shows up on the scene. You see the power of God. And when you see the power of God, what happened? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in that fiery furnace. By the way, there was a lady in our church that had lost their daughter the year before to the same disease. She came down. She was one of the first ones to the hospital. She later told me, she goes, Dwight, I can't explain it. She goes, but I felt God, God didn't save my little girl, but I felt like he was going to save your son. And I said, I appreciate that. Turns out later we were in the same room, same ward, same place. And all I'm saying is, is this. I got a guy that calls me. He's in my Sunday school class, couples class at the time. And when we were sitting there, he's bawling like a baby. Dude, how are you handling this? You know, and I said, the same way I've been teaching you. Get in the Word of God. Find you some promises and cling to them. I said, I got to get going. Just be praying for us. I will, I will. Hung up the phone, and I walked in. As I'm walking from where I was talking on the phone back to the room, I said, Lord, that was big talk. But you got to help me find some promises. Amen. That same night, I went home and was praying and said, Lord, help me to be better, not bitter. I had two pages worth of promises. Amen. Taped them up on the door of our hospital room. I said, these stay as long as we're here. We're going to claim the promises of God. If you will, I don't know what time we are here. Go to John chapter 4. John chapter number 4. You get reading and you're looking for that one thing that helps you in that make or break moment. And uh, in verse 46 it says this. So Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee, where he had made the water into wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. And when he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then said Jesus, except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The nobleman saith unto him, Sir, come down ere my child die. Then I got my promise. Jesus saith unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. I've got written in my Bible, 72803, and I wrote my son's name. I said, Lord, that's the verse I've been looking for. There's a verse for everything that you're looking for in life, it's there. If it's not exactly like it is, but in principle and in truth, it's in the book. And I read that verse. I got back up and watch what it says here. And I didn't realize this part till later. I was more excited about the part, go thy way, thy son liveth. But after that, it said, and the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him and went his way. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, thy son liveth. Then he inquired of them the hour he began to amend. And they said unto him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. So the father knew that it was the same hour in which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth. And himself believed in his whole house. What I'm saying is, is this. I took, I believed, I went about my life at that point. I thought, I got my promise, I wrote it down, I dated it, only to find out later, two and a half years later, our son relapsed. Now, I got to admit, I was crushed. Didn't know what to do at that point. I'd already gotten my promise. God gave me my promise, and I was trusting him to come through on that promise. But you know where I found myself? At another make or break moment. That morning, I found myself praying. One morning, I should say. If you'll turn to John chapter number 9. I found myself praying. And I said, Lord, is this come upon my son because of me or my wife? 
all of a sudden you start to look inwardly and think what's happening. Go back to Satan as the accuser of the brethren. And he gets to working on your mind at your weakest point. That was a weak point. It was a vulnerable point in my life. And I got done praying that, and I went to do my devotion for the day, and it was John chapter 9 and verse 1. It said, Jesus passed by and saw a man which was blind from his birth. In other words, he was afflicted. His disciples asked him, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And I thought to myself, funny, I just read this, or I just prayed this. And then all of a sudden, there it is right in front of me. And Jesus said, Neither hath this man sinned, nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Amen. It was at that point I sat there and I said, Lord, I understand now. You're doing a work. I'm going to leave you to it. Amen. Later, a nurse came up and said, I wouldn't worry about that. She said, you know, the kids that have the hardest time recovering are the ones that usually recover the best. There's that little handful we're visiting a church in Florida, a couple sitting behind us in the bench, in the pews behind us and, or in front of us, and they kept looking back, looking back. Finally, she, the lady just asked my wife, she says, does he have leukemia? And Kathy said, yeah. She goes, she looked just like our son when he was that age. He had leukemia too. Then this kid comes over, he's about 6'4", and she goes, this is him now. I look at my son, he's not 6'4" but he's 19 years old. We didn't know if he was going to make it to three. But God does things that we don't understand. And his story's not done. I close with this illustration. I went to, uh, we were on our way for a treatment to go up there. To look at my son, you really couldn't tell he was taking chemo treatments. Wide open, running, going and everything. And so we're taking him up for a treatment. Kathy had to have work done on her vehicle. So I said, well, we stopped off at this uh, uh, dealership. And on the way there, and I said, all right, you go on and tell them what you need work done in your van. We're going to go inside the showroom. And so we go inside the showroom there. And uh, while we're in the showroom, I said, we're just going to jump in and out of the car. So we're in these T-Bird uh, convertible and we're room, 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 you know playing around and we jump in the next car and we're playing around and all of a sudden you hear this lady, sir, sir. I'm thinking, oh great, she's going to holler at us now. So I get out of the car, I go over to her and she goes, now don't get offended if I ask you this. I said, what, you want us to get out of the car? We'll get out of the car, it's no problem. She goes, no. She goes, is he sick? She pointed right over to my son. And I said, well, he has leukemia if that's what you mean. She goes, yeah. She goes, the Lord's just laid it on my heart to pray for him. Do you mind if I pray for him? Amen. I said, well, I'm not going to stop you if the Lord's laid it on your heart. Her name was Irene Holt. Never seen her again. Never seen her before. I must have been attending angels unawares. You know, but then I have to change my story on that because I was preaching to a group of teenagers at Sandy Creek High School. And one of them said, I believe her kids used to come to our school. I said, well, you ruined it for me. And she goes, why? I said, because all this time I thought I was attending angels unaware. Now I know she's real. And, uh, but in any case, she got done praying. She goes, you know, I believe the Lord's going to heal him. And he's also going to carry the mantle of a preacher after his namesake. She goes, what's his name? And I said, Isaiah. She goes, yeah, prophet in the Bible. Now, she never heard me call him by his name. She never met him before, anything. I've got to believe that's of the Lord. Now, that said, God calls men, Dad does it. If that's what's going to happen to my son, then it'll happen to my son, but it'll be God that did it. I'm hoping, but who knows? I want it to be God's will in his life regardless. And that's the whole thing. So I guess what I'm saying today is this, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. God's going to do as he pleases. Why? Because he wants to get the glory for when you come out of your trials. Will you indulge me this last one? 
I'll tell you how I got Romans 8, 28. I'm up in a church up in New York State, out in the country. I said, I'm praying. I'm struggling when my son relapsed. And I'm sitting there, I'm going, Lord, as far as I know, I don't know anybody here, and nobody knows me. I just want to go in, and I want to hear from you. What happened? I go in. They have their shaking hand time. About three rows in front of me was an elder gentleman, probably late 80s, early 90s. He gets up, and he's just... It caught my attention because he's just... But he's going down, went down, down, right to where we were, where you were. Came up to me and he said, Romans 8, 28. Romans 8, 28. Romans 8, 28. He goes, you don't know what that says, Donald. I said, well, help me get it started at that time. I said, help me get it started, and I'll help you finish it. And he said, we know, and I said, we, all things work together for good. And we got done, and he shook my hand, and he said, Romans 8, 28. Scuffled away, never said hi, never said bye, never said his name. Just came up, Romans 8, 28. I walked out of the church that night. I was mad. I'm being honest. I said, Lord, I went in there to hear from you tonight and get a message and hear from you, and you didn't give me nothing. He goes, you got Romans 8, 28, didn't you? And I said, I sure did. Later to hear about, if you've ever heard the story of Dr. Lee Robertson with Camp Joy. Camp Joy was started out of Romans 8, 28. He struggled with the death of his two-year-old girl. And out of that, he was trying to make a sense out of it all. He didn't understand why it happened. He couldn't figure it out. He just trusted God. He had a make-or-break moment. And when he had that make-or-break moment, he just took and said, I'm going to go ahead and trust God. So they made a place called Camp Joy. It's a camp for kids, summer camp and so forth. A lot of kids saved through that ministry. We've got a guy in our church that was saved in that ministry. All you got to do is mention camp. Oh, I got saved there. And he'll turn in a heartbeat and tell you he got saved there. The key to remember is, is this. We know all things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. We don't have to understand why it happened. We just have to understand and know that our Lord allowed it to happen for a reason so that he can get the honor and the glory for it. Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this time. Lord, I pray this was a help and a blessing. I pray that you'll guide steps, you'll direct path, help us to make or break and go the right way, the path that thou would lead us on. And Lord, I pray and I ask that you just help us during this time. If there be any here today that may be going through some troubles, maybe having some trials that they're facing. And Lord, they need to find that promise in the Word of God. There's that promise in the Word of God that just says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We can find that promise, and Lord, we can rest upon the Word of God. We know that we can do as you say and trust you by your Word. Lord, you wouldn't lie to us. You can't lie. And so, therefore, we have a foundation that's unshakable and unmovable. And we can always abound in the work of the Lord. So, Lord, as we come to you tonight, but there may be that one that does not have Christ as their Lord and Savior. They don't even know what this is all about because they've never received thee as Lord and Savior. Lord, they're not in on it. And they're missing out. As that nurse once said when I tried to witness to her, and she just said, I said, what if this was you instead of my son? And she turned it around and said, she goes, you know, everyone that comes into this hospital is praying. I think the difference is, is you know who you're praying to. Never would have looked at it that way. But the Lord allowed me to hear what she said. And so as we come to you today, Lord, would you have your way? As the music plays, Jay? Jay?
Amen. That's a good message. And uh, one of my favorite verses, uh, you know, a lot of people quote that verse, but they always start, they don't ever start, a lot of people don't start with, and we know. <laughs> That's the way the Bible st starts with that verse in Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. You know, do you know this morning? That's my question to you is, do you know? Because uh, if you know him and you know his heart, you know if you're born again, then you know in your heart that all things work together for good that love God, the, them that are called according to his purpose. You know, everybody goes through things. We all go through those make or break moments. We had one just about two years ago, well, a little bit less than two years ago, with our son and, of course, our daughter-in-law going on to be with the Lord. But, um, you know, God's still working in my son's life. He's He's, he's not there, and um, I, I really believe he's saved, but he's he needs your prayers. He's, he's still not there, and uh, but you all remember him in prayer, Brent Brandon, that uh, God will work in his heart and life and, and get him back in church. They're, they're not in church. They're floundering, and, and he's involved in a lot of stuff he shouldn't be involved in, and uh, he told me, he said, you know, I tried it God's way, now I'm trying to I'm trying it my way. Well, you never win when you try it your way. It, it never gets better when you try it your way. Uh, when you try it and do it God's way, even though whatever comes in your life, uh, go back to him. He's the only one that can uh, fill that, that pain in your heart. He can only, he's the only one that can fill that hole that's missing. And uh, not another person, I keep telling him, not another wife, not another girl. It's, a, it's the Lord. He's the only one who can do it. And so uh, just remember that. But uh, appreciate Brother uh, Dwight and his wife coming this morning and preaching for us. And and uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. And uh, today, uh, 4 o'clock, Brother R.C. King is going to be preaching for us online. And I uh, talked to him this morning. And just be praying that uh, God will give him something we stand in need of from the Word of God. And uh, let's, any, any prayer requests for we go before we dismiss brother victor Oh, yeah. I saw something over there, just want to walk over there. I'm caving in again, so uh, just be careful. I'm going to call them, and maybe I'll do it this afternoon, call them and tell them and get them to come over and block that road off again. Because it gets all collapsed. You remember that? You know the folks that were around? So just remember that nobody gets hurt by that. Uh, Amen. Praying for that. Any other prayer requests? Uh, let's remember those who are out also. We have a number of people who are not come back. And uh, let's try to pray and encourage them to come back to church. And I, I know that, you know, everybody's afraid of all this stuff going around. And, you know, just take precautions. I mean, if you're if you're sick, obviously don't come to church, you know. But but uh, <clears throat> if you don't feel comfortable, wear a mask. If, you know, if you don't feel comfortable, wear gloves, whatever it takes. But get back in the Lord's house and... and uh, you know, try to be here. You know, it's, uh, we're encouraged to come to the house of God, not come to the computer. <laughs> so, you know, that's what the Bible teaches, right? Not to forsake the gathering of yourselves together. You know, that's what the Bible teaches. So we need to get back to the house of God. If you're listening by live stream, and we'd love to see you back. And try to encourage people to, if you get a, can, get on the phone, call some people that you see missing and 
try to ask them, uh, you know, just how they're doing and, and try to encourage them to come back to church. And, uh, but there, if any of, if there's not any other prayer requests, yeah, Brother Dwight. Benjamin, I know. Talking about the same Benjamin I do? Not not that Benjamin. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, Miss Edna. Amen. Let's remember uh, Miss Edna's friend Carolyn. God will work in her behalf. Yeah, brother. Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Yes, yeah, so let's be, be praying for her family and Miss Ellen's family. And uh, I believe I heard the other day Sammy, Brother Sammy Allen passed away also up in uh and he was you know he was way on up in age i don't you know i know he had had some medical problems anyway but but i'm not sure what exactly with the details i just know he he went to be with the lord and so brother sammy allen's with the lord and him and preacher and all of them up there having a good time and amen you have a prayer request all right let's go to the lord and pray oh uh yeah i'm sorry Oh, yes, brother. What is his name? I keep. I always forget his name. So, okay. Brother Jubentino's nephew. Okay, let's remember him in prayer and. Yeah. Yeah. Let's let's be praying for him. Uh, so let's go to the Lord in prayer, and we'll be dismissed. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you this morning. Uh, Father, thank you for, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ, and thank you for saving our souls, Lord, and Lord providing that way for salvation, Lord. I pray, Lord, if there's anyone here in this place that doesn't know you and the free pardon of sin, I pray, Lord, that they would just. Uh, repent of their sins, Lord, and call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and Lord, that they might be saved, and Lord, you'd work in their hearts and lives, and I pray, Lord, you'd help us all to submit our lives to you daily, Lord, and and God, I pray that your will will be done in our church, Lord. I pray, Lord, for our members, Lord, and for those that have not been with us for it in a while, and I pray, Lord, you'd just uh, help them. I pray that you'd heal them if they're sick, and, and Lord, if there's other problems, Lord, I pray that you'd uh, help them deal with them, and and, Lord, for all these requests that were made, Lord, and, uh, Lord, I pray that you would just uh, bless each and every one, Lord, and all those that were voiced. And I know, Lord, that there were some that were not mentioned that are upon our hearts, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you would, uh, uh, Lord, we know that you know them, Lord, just as you know every hair upon our heads, Lord. And I pray that you would just uh, have your will and way in each life. Lord, just thank you for your blessings, Lord. Thank you for this place that we can meet in, and Lord, we can uh, sing praises to your name and, and worship you, Lord. And Lord, I pray that you would just uh, be glorified in all that we do and say. I pray that you would just bless us as we go on our ways, Lord. And, and Lord, may you be glorified in everything we pray in Christ's name. Amen. You're dismissed.